Welcome from last year at COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. This is the 11th in a series of webinars brought to you by the NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine, the National University Health System, and the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. My name is Claire Chong, and I am a third-year medical student at the NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine. In this COVID-19 Updates from Singapore weekly webinar series, we will be sharing viewpoints and insights from leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialties and disciplines. To introduce our panel of experts for tonight, it is my honour to invite our programme director, Dr. David Allen, who will also be moderator for tonight's session. Dr. Allen was recruited to establish an infectious diseases training programme here in Singapore and became the first infectious diseases head of department at the Communicable Disease Centre in 1992. He is also a visiting senior fellow of the Courage Fund at the University. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Allen. Thank you, Claire. Good evening and welcome to the 11th installment of our webinar, COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. We hope this broadcast continues to find you and your loved ones safe and well. More than 5,000 participants have registered for tonight's webinar. We take this opportunity to acknowledge the support from a sampling of our viewers. Grant Medical College and its official publication, GMC Chronicles, in Saeed Student Life SG, and SG Innovate. Thank you. The topic for tonight's episode is development of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines during the COVID, excuse me, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. What can we expect? Our guest expert this week to help answer that question is Dr. Marie Paul Kinney, whom I will formally introduce after Dale's epidemiology update. We'll be changing our format this week. Dale will start off with an update of regional and international COVID-19 epidemiology as usual. Following that, Claire and I will have a question and answer session with Dr. Kinney on this evening's topic. We do wish you send in your questions. We will get to as many of your questions as possible. After the Q&A, Dale will provide a weekly review of current events of interest, and following which I'll uh, summarize tonight's key points, provide a preview of next week's guest expert, and reveal the mystery pandemic song of the week. Again, please send in your questions and we welcome your comments of how we can better serve you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dale Fisher, Professor of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Yongwu Lin School of Medicine. He's Senior Consultant in the Division of Infectious Disease at National University Hospital and Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network hosted by World Health Organization. Dale, over to you. Okay, well, uh, let's get into it. Um, as, 
as always, we start with the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, University graphic and, and you can see that uh, a week has gone past and we're just under a million cases a week. So that's, that's what you can, you can see that's being diagnosed around the world uh, and around 30, 33,000 deaths are, are recorded. So the, the number of uh, the ranking of the countries, I guess, is very, very similar. India's uh, coming up through, uh, Peru's coming up through as, as we, what we know about the, the various epicenters around the world. Uh, deaths, almost 120,000 in the US now. Uh, Brazil um, also doing it, doing it tough. So this brings us to the, the global epi curve. Um, not a lot uh, different to, to last week. We're seeing around 120, 140,000 uh, cases um, per day, uh, and we're seeing around 5,000 deaths per day. So um, that uh, is, is pretty consistent. Here's a, here's a new graphic that, uh, that I received, and you can see the, the time to, to reach each million cases. So it took, uh, took three months from when uh, it was first uh, announced in China. So didn't really get to most of the rest of the world till till after January, but um, but nonetheless it was it was slower at the start, and as you can see, it's uh, it is picking up as as you would expect. So now we're seeing eight days to to turn over a million cases, uh, and the deaths as as we've seen equally slow at the start because of the number of cases, um, but uh, it, that that numbers come right down. And in fact, it's 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 slowing, and and we've seen that because of what's happening in in Europe with that that massive uh, fall in the death rate uh, over the last uh, month or so. So, so it's uh, it's now about three weeks to 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 get a hundred thousand deaths. The epi curves across the WHO regions, again, not a lot of change. Africa um, picking up, um, Emro, uh, Paho. Ciaro, they're all on the increase. Wipro is, is remarkably low, the Western Pacific region where we are, and, and Europe, as we know, that's coming down, although although seems to be plateauing a little bit. We can come to that later. Um, main thing is to look at the, the y-axis here. So Africa, African region, is seeing around 8,000 cases a day, whereas the Eastern Mediterranean is on 20,000. Uh, Euro's on about, uh, now on about 20,000. Uh, the Americas uh, are in the 70s, Southeast Asian regions 15, and, and, and look at Wipro, it's just remarkable, down uh, a bit over a thousand cases uh, a day across the whole region. So uh, very different uh, epidemiologies. Um, you can see Singapore is making its way down as the, the number of cases in the dorms reported is, is coming down. Um, Philippines, uh, uh, they're, they're obviously struggling a little bit. They've uh, recently locked down uh, Cebu um, and maintained all their all their restrictions in Manila. So so they're they're really working hard on on lockdowns, but it's uh, it's it's obviously uh, challenging. Um, Korea, I'll I'll come back to. There's a, a nice little story there um, here. So th these graphs look a little bit like our ones that I show later on. Um, uh, related to Singapore and the different outbreaks. So you can see the different epidemic curves in different parts of, of Korea. So here is, is Seoul, and you can see like there's this second wave, if you like, but look at the number of cases. And uh, so many people have been asking me recently, what is an acceptable number of cases in Singapore? And I pointed out that we, we had about 70 cases a day um, just before the, the circuit breaker was brought in. So I figured 20, 30, 40, uh, as long as it was flat and it wasn't rising, I, I would think that would be quite manageable. So here we are in, in, in Seoul, well, Seoul's about 10 million and, and it's managing around 20, 20 cases a day. So, so and this is made up of, of clusters. There's, there's clusters in churches, daycare centers, uh, an elementary school, um, you know, the nightclub one that spread to the, e-commerce uh, outlet. Um, there's one in Richway, which is a, a, an events company, which particularly organizes events for the elderly. So what we're seeing is, is actually places 
uh, sorry, small clusters in pl in places where you do your work um, and and schooling. So so I think this is a little bit of a lesson to us. I think this is good to have little clusters because zero a zero is not really um, uh, likely. And and that's the same in in Incheon. You can see at peaks of twenty. Uh, and, and indeed across the whole of uh, Yonji province, they're looking at 20. So there's a, a little map there. So, so I think this is uh, an example of what we're trying to, to create in Singapore, just a very flat curve, lots of clusters, and we shut them down quickly. I guess the news of the week was, was the cluster in, in China. You can see a, a little epi curve that, uh, that is, is evolving there. Um, now, as, as we know, this was in a, in a wet market, um, it's, uh, it's, it's hot with theories. Um, I'll, I won't read through all that, but uh, there's, there's about 121 cases linked to this, 45 directly from the market, and all the rest are, are secondary cases. Uh, at least that was as of uh, a day or two ago. A uh, lot of sampling in the, in the market that's, that's all pending. And this is what I mean, and this is what you see happens in, in Korea when there's a cluster, that there's just a, a massive amount of testing very low threshold to test, looking for asymptomatic cases, obviously looking for symptomatic cases. Uh, and in fact, even 30,000 visitors that had, that had been to the market in the last 14 days were, were being, being uh, traced. So um, there's theories around this. Um, uh, because it's 50 days since the last case in, in Beijing, um, the, the theory that would seem most obvious is human to human transmission, but 50 days is like five or 10 generations of cases. Um, and that to me just uh, is a little bit um, unlikely. Um, the other unlikely one is, uh, is was it brought in on, on food? And, and we know that it survives uh, days, the, the COVID virus, and it survives days and, and even longer if it's, if it's cold. Uh, and, and even longer if it's frozen. In fact, if we want to store virus and, and, and experiment on it later, that's exactly what we do, we freeze it. So I'm certainly not writing off the, the uh, possibility that this has been imported. And, and I'm told, I haven't read, but I've, I've, I've heard on the lay media that uh, the genetics are consistent with being imported from Europe. So anyway, it's, uh, it's an interesting theory, it'll certainly change what we do a bit, I think, if, uh, if we can find that it's starting to get imported on, on frozen products from, from countries with, with, with severe um, epidemics. Uh, the other thing is we know that there's been outbreaks in meatpacking plants and things like that. So these are potential hotspots. Anyway, moving on, um, Australia and New Zealand are the other uh, countries that we, we like to talk about in, in Wipro. And you see they've both got very low numbers of cases. Uh, you will have heard about the, the, the three uh, in New Zealand, the, the two ladies from the UK that, that are New Zealanders, but uh, they were allowed out of quarantine because they had a, a dying parent. Um, and then they were found to, to be positive having traveled from across the length of the, the North Island from, from Auckland down to, to Wellington. So that's creating a, a bit of a stir. Um, India is, is continuing to, to, to increase. There is a, a reconciliation here. Their, their death rate is, uh, is normally around 300, and you can see they've just reported 2,000 deaths. Um, that's probably from uh, just catching up on, on reporting, which we've seen happen in China. Uh, and the main places, um, it seems to be Mumbai and, and uh, Maharashtra. Um, Bangladesh also on the way up with uh, the, their uh, numbers increasing, likewise, uh, across the region. Iran, with its second wave after it un unlocked all its um, restrictions. Um, I think that's uh, about all from, from this one. Um, Afghanistan is interesting for the, this is, they're describing being overwhelmed in their hospitals. Um, with, with now a thousand cases a day. They've only got about three and a half thousand beds in their, in their public hospitals. So they've had to team up with the, with the private sector there. But this is a place where the hospitals are, are usually full of um, war victims and, and malnutrition and things. So they've really outrun their, their lab capacity, their bed capacity and, uh, and having a hard time of it. 
Um, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, we can see Russia's, Russia's flattening off, UK's coming down, uh, and, and you can see all these black lines descending, and that's, that's really why the, the global death rate has been, been coming down so much. Um, looking across, Netherlands is, uh, I think I've mentioned before about uh, cats and, and minks, and, and they've, they've now had out, outbreaks in 15 mink uh, farms, and, uh, and now there's been one in, uh, in Denmark where they're gonna cull all the minks. I think there's about 11,000 minks they're gonna cull, but uh, I guess it's to protect the, the industry, uh, which I didn't even really know existed still, but, uh, but, but nonetheless, there's that, and, and there's, there's Sweden, um, which we, we also like to, to follow. Um, South Africa is, um, is, uh, is, is again seeing most of the cases. This is a country of about 60 million, so, so 4,000 cases a day there. Um, Nigeria, their, their doctors have, have gone on strike. Um, the doctor's not looking after COVID patients, and the, the two main reasons are lack of PPE, and, and they also want some, some hazard money because they're, they're very underpaid and, and their lives are really on the line. So, so a lot of doctors since uh, for about the last two days have, have been on strike. So that's uh, an interesting turn there. Um, this is, uh, there's uh, Sierra Leone is, is joining the list of countries that have had a, um, uh, a prison outbreak. So there's about uh, 30 cases in this uh, Pademba Road prison. Um, DRC, just when you things, thought things couldn't get worse. The good thing is, is that in one week, the North Kivu outbreak can be declared over. They're, they're up to 51 days since their last case. But of course, we know in Ecuador, there's another outbreak started. But now in um, uh, Ituri, just north of North Kivu, they've got a, a plague outbreak. So uh, they've had uh, about 10 cases of, of both bubonic and septicemic plague. So, so it's, um, it's a good infectious disease less, lesson if you, uh, if you head over to DRC. Um, these are the Americas. Obviously, Brazil is, uh, is leading with these 30,000 cases a day, 3,000 deaths a day. Um, Peru, um, uh, still marching on. They've, uh, they've had a, quite a few deaths in um, inmates in prisons as well. Uh, as well as um, about 170 police officers have died, 50 healthcare workers have died. So, uh, and, and they've also uh, really for some time now, I've had a lot of trouble getting oxygen and this seems to, to still be a, a problem in, in Peru. Um, so we can see all the, other, uh, all the other countries of the region there. And that's, that's why the PAHO is, is also on the climb. So over to Singapore. Um, we know we've got hardly any any cases now, so uh, in the community. So here's the, uh, the the linked cases. So the last three days, one zero three, unlinked is uh, is two two two. So so and these are un unlinked app diagnosis. These these uh, at least uh, when I asked about a month ago, about half of these were getting linked. So so I suspect they're all getting linked now. I can find out. And here's our three um, uh, epidemic curves. The imported cases, still very rare now. Uh, the community cases just grumbling on. And the, the dormitory residents now coming down to, to one or 200 cases a day uh, and light at the end of the tunnel. But it's still a, still, st still a, a bit of a tunnel. But uh, we, we would think over the next uh, few weeks, we'll start seeing some workers coming back. Uh, some dorms are more complex and will take a bit longer to, to clear. And what's happening in our hospitals? Well, in the whole country, there's two patients in ICU. Um, there's, there's about uh, 9,000 in our community care facilities, and there's about 250 in our wards. So very, very stable position from our, our healthcare sector point of view. Back to you, David. Great, Dale. Thank you so much. It's uh, now my honor to uh, introduce our guest expert tonight. She is uh, Marie Paul Kinney, Dr. Kinney. She's Director of Priority Research Program on Antimicrobial Resistance at INSERM, Chair of the Board, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, 
Chair of the Governance Board, Medicines Patent Pool Foundation, Vice Chair of the Board, Global Antibiotics Research and Develop Partnership. She previously led the World Health Organization's efforts in the areas of universal health coverage, health systems, and innovation. The focus of tonight's uh, discussion is development of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic. What can we expect? Dr. Kenny, welcome. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Before we get to some of our questions, if we could have our first slide, and let me just uh, allow our viewers to take a moment to, to review that. Uh, we spoke of uh, some of these, uh, uh, or these positions that you hold. Um, and I wonder if you could uh, speak just a moment about what your responsibilities and how it relates to COVID uh, at INSERM, the Director of Priority Research Program on Antimicrobial Resistance. Uh, thank you very much. Well, actually, you know, in, in, in France, uh, like, like in many parts of the world, the, the normal program and the normal priority have had somewhat shaken by the COVID-19. So while we are, we are, we are continuing to, uh, to move ahead with the calls for a proposal for the, uh, for the priority, AMR priority pro project, we also have a lot of, of uh, COVID-19 research activity. So I, I do uh, assess uh, Yazdan Yazdan Pana, who's responsible for the discovery trial of therapeutics, who's an add-on trial to the global solidarity trial launched by, by WHO. Uh, and I am also responsible for uh, a new committee, scientific committee, which looks at, uh, at uh, COVID-19 and advises the, the government on, on, on these vaccines. So uh, it's, uh, it's now a mixed portfolio of old things and uh, new things. Great, thanks. Uh, it gives us a bit of a perspective of uh, where, you're, where you're speaking from. Uh, Claire, do you have a question for Dr. Kenny? Yes, Dr. Allen, we do. Dr. Kenny, the first question for you would be, you chaired a WHO two-day closed-door research forum in Geneva with more than 300 scientists and researchers in February about COVID-19. Could you share with us about what resulted from that meeting? Well, I would think that a lot has already uh, leaked out of this uh, closed-door meetings, but uh, uh, it was an excellent meeting. It was very timely that the WHO set it up because it allowed to, uh, for people to come and converge and, and have a clear understanding of what was known and maybe of what was not known. And among what was not known, what were the priorities? And many priorities were about the natural history of disease, for example, uh, the, some pathogenic manifestation that we, we didn't know. And since then, as, as we know, we know that we have seen much, much more, including, um, uh, and surge of non-communicable disease uh, symptoms. Uh, there was also uh, identified a need uh, for working on uh, on drugs, repurposed drugs or, or new drugs uh, to uh, to accelerate research and development of vaccines. And, and as you know, this has been very much followed with uh, with uh, how they say with a lot of action activity throughout the world. We have a question from one of our viewers, Professor Tanban Hawk. Uh, his question is, do you think uh, that the neutralizing antibodies generated by SARS-CoV-2 will provide lifelong immunity? Well, you know, it's very rare that uh, antibodies, anti neutralizing antibodies stay there for, uh, for a long time. So uh, there are two points to that, to that uh, response. First, we don't know uh, whether the uh, neutralizing antibodies are the only factor and the factor and how they contribute to, to protection. And, uh, and we don't know uh, whether they will persist, even if it's the case long enough. So uh, I, uh, I don't really have a crystal ball and I must say that I don't know, but most likely not for that. And can we extrapolate to say, likewise, we don't know uh, with a vaccine if we're going to develop lifelong uh, neutralizing antibodies? I think it's unlikely. Uh, you know, the vaccines which provide uh, lifelong protection are not that frequent. And, uh, and at this point, uh, we would be very lucky if it would be the case. But at this point, you know, also what everybody is looking for is a vaccine that would be efficacious, at least moderately efficacious in reducing uh, the severity of disease, reducing death, 
we hope reducing transmission, but that's not, this is not a given yet with what I've seen of the results. And, uh, and if it would work for a year or a couple of years, potentially more, that would be already very good. Mm. Uh, while working in your role as Assistant Director General of the WHO uh, during the Ebola outbreak in the mid-2000s, you spoke of the massive rapid international mobilization of actors from both the private and public sector, which fast-tracked research, vaccine development, and saved lives uh, during that outbreak for the common good. But weren't developed countries initially slow to respond, and didn't the WHO have to take the unusual step of sponsoring the Ebola vaccine trial as no one wanted to do that? Of course, you know, there's always, uh, I would say, this is natural in front of a crisis. Uh, there's sometimes some delay in sort of lighting up, uh, like in an old car. And, uh, and this can be done first because this moves on the uh, people from their ordinary schedule. Uh, and there's a phase of, uh, of uh, how do I say, not believing what's happening. And then, uh, and then trying to say, oh, terrible, let's, let's move on and, and do something. And, uh, and uh, I, I would say that uh, the, the images that uh, everybody saw on TVs over the whole world of seeing patients, Ebola patients, you know, taken to, uh, to the treatment centers and, and actually uh, being lying dead in the, in the ambulances or, or, or at the door, of these, uh, of these treatment centers because they were completely overwhelmed, uh, ha has moved, I think, the world to say this is not acceptable. In the world we live in, in, the, in a world of technology, in the world of med advanced medical science, it is not possible that we let these people die like that. And this is only uh, by seeing the, the, the humanitarian problem, the human disaster, that, uh, that finally everybody said, let's, let's now move. Now, you mentioned uh, the Guinea, uh, the trial of uh, efficacy trial in, in Guinea uh, of, the, of the vaccine, which the WHO sponsored uh, under my responsibility. Um, yes, I, I wouldn't say that the rest of the world was not interested, but uh, the main sponsors had already um, chosen the place and the design to do clinical trials in Liberia and in Sierra Leone, and, uh, and Guinea was left aside. So, uh, so the Guinean uh, government came to WHO and said, we want to be part of it. And this is how WHO unusually actually stepped up to, uh, to, uh, to be the main actor of this clinical trial. Mm. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so countries and, and companies stepped up uh, because of altruism or because of self-interest? Um, or does it matter? Well, I think, no, well, first it doesn't matter so much, but I would say that you know, they were also moved, I think, because, you know, in companies, you also have people. And not all of them are evil, I must say, <laughs> far from that. <laughs> They're good friends also in the industry. And, uh, and some, uh, you know, to, to just cite some of those who are the most uh, uh, committed, uh, as we all know, Janssen, for example, because uh, Paul Stockel himself. Uh, was uh, was in in uh, the DRC at the time of a very big uh, initial outbreak of uh, of Ebola, and he lived through this, and uh, and he wanted to contribute to that. And sometimes, you know, individual individuals matter, um, and uh, and the, the same with uh, with GSK and the, and Andrew Wiki. There was also this universalism. Uh, thinking that we may not always see uh, now in many companies. You, you co-authored uh, this editorial very recently. Uh, what message were you and your co-authors trying to, to get across? Well, the, what we wanted to say, in fact, the message was that I think that we needed to reinforce multilateralism rather than weaken it. To recognize that WHO's organization was not perfect, that none is perfect, and you know the bureaucracy are like they are. Uh, but rather to try to pretend that we will invent something else, I think it's better to work with WHO. And the first thing would be to reinforce its mandate, because the mandate is being eaten from all sides by you know this and such, that uh, uh, public-private partnership, another one, and the money is going in other places. And so at the end, uh, WHO ends up being uh, um, very poor, financially speaking, 
been asked to do many things and had to prioritize. And then, of course, governance uh, is, uh, is important, not always to the right level, but let's work all together, protect WHO, reinforce WHO, reinforce multilateralism, and avoid nationalistic uh, uh, tendencies that we see too much these days. Um, regarding vaccine development, what are the strengths and weaknesses of uh, government-backed public health research institutions such as INSERM as well as uh, uh, versus private companies, which are often also backed by government uh, funds? What, what, are the, uh, what do they bring to the table individually? Well, you know, innovation uh, these days are mainly made either in academia or, or in biotech. It's rare that innovation and basic innovation happen now in, in large industries. So what the industry do is that when there is an initiative which looks uh, promising, then they push it. And, and this is typically what we, we've seen in COVID-19, because when we see uh, uh, more and more companies have actually purchased uh, either small biotech, uh, let me cite, for example, Merck, uh, which has just uh, purchased uh, a small company in Austria called Timis, uh, who was developing a, vac a, a vaccine developed by Institut Pasteur in France based on a measles vector. So uh, Merck bought Timis. Uh, let's uh, see also um, the, the work done at Ox by Oxford University in the UK. Uh, which had developed a uh, chimpanzee, chimpanzee adenovirus based candidate vaccine, which was recently acquired by AstraZeneca. Well, not the university, but the, the vaccine. And so on and so forth. Uh, Merck also has uh, signed an agreement with Ivy on their, uh, on their VSV COVID 19 vaccine, which I find very promising because this is the basis, the basic, the basis of the Merck um, Ebola vaccine and, and a few others. So uh, innovation really is, is happening using mostly public money, but then uh, there's no doubt that we need the, the, you know, the capacity and production capacity of large pharma to, uh, uh, to develop the, the product. But this could be developed by uh, companies in, um, in the developed world like uh, like the one that belong to the IFPMA, uh, uh, I would say association, or it could also uh, happen through involvement of, of manufacturers in the developing country vaccine manufacturers network, uh, where uh, where the largest production of vaccine occurs, and uh, and uh, WHO is looking at the quality of this vaccine. I can easily tell you that they are of high quality. Great, thank you. Uh, if we could put up the slide uh, with solidarity and discovery trials. Uh, yep, there you go. This is a, uh, a tweet, I think, that you retweeted. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little about that, about the, the discovery and uh, uh, strategy trials? You know, it is very important to, uh, to do large trials, as we've seen. Uh, so, for example, the, the, the trial which has delivered the most right now is a trial which didn't happen in France, actually, but happened in the UK, which is the recovery trial. And they were able, uh, because they decided from the beginning of the outbreak that the clinical trial centers in the uh, UK needed to join in one clinical trial, one platform, and this was recovery. They were able to recruit more than 10,000 patients. So what happened in France is that uh, uh, quite quickly the discovery trial was set up, and it was meant to be um, meant to be a pan-European trial. But then, uh, uh, without the UK, because the UK couldn't participate, they wanted to join, but they were asked to join the recovery trial. But what happened with discovery is that uh, uh, at the same time in France, for example, a lot of other small trials were financed and approved by different uh, funding schemes. And, uh, and as a result, there was, there was a competition, if I may say, to recruit patients. Moreover, there was all the controversy about hydroxychloroquine, and because the, the trial was testing hydroxychloroquine, as soon as a patient was on hydroxychloroquine, we couldn't recruit him anymore, or him or her. And, and so this is, shows, and now there are barely any cases. Last week, I think, uh, Discovery recruited five patients. So this is why it is so important that recovery is part of a large uh, solidarity trial, which was launched by WHO, 
which is recruiting now very quickly because it's recruiting in Iran and Dane has shown the epidemiology in, in current epidemic in, uh, in Iran. It's recruiting in Brazil. And so we hope that uh, um, through, through the recruitment in other countries outside of Europe, we will soon have enough data to give uh, an appropriate and a significant uh, answer on uh, the value of treatment like remdesivir, for example. Remdesivir for the timing has been proven, what? To reduce the time of hospitalization. The, the, the demonstration of reduction of mortality is ever anything but weak. And, um, and so we hope that solidarity will provide these answers and, and try that, like discovery to a part of solidarity, uh, which is happening in Europe and has more power, if I may say, to do um, uh, very precise measurements of, uh, of biochemical parameters will provide the finesse uh, that a trial like Solidarity, which looks at mortality and, and, uh, and advanced disease, will not be able to provide. Um, Claire, do you have a question for Dr. Kinney? I think a very key question that everyone is on everyone's mind is, are you confident that a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine can be found? Because we don't have vaccines for SARS or MERS yet, and it took 30 years for a HIV vaccine to be developed. Well, you know, as I often say, I don't know exactly where I put my question ball. Uh, so uh, I think we need to be modest when we answer these questions. Uh, some diseases, as you, as you, as you said, you know, HIV, we still don't have uh, um, a vaccine. Well, we don't have a vaccine against SARS-1 because the, the disease stopped before there was even time to develop a vaccine. So we, we don't know whether it's usable or not. For MERS, there has been not that much effort in, 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 uh, in, in invested into developing the, uh, the MERS vaccine because you know, the question is, for MERS, who would you vaccinate? The one who die from MERS are mainly old people hospitalized. And these are the less likely targets for vaccination because uh, as, uh, as many of, uh, of the people listening to us will know, uh, actually there is a phenomenon which is called immunosenescence, which means that as we age, we lose the capacity to react to, to, new, um, uh, to new signals, to new uh, uh, encounters that the immune sy uh, uh, system makes. And therefore we react much less well uh, to, uh, to vaccines. Uh, for example, it is well known that influenza vaccines, seasonal influenza vaccines, are moderately effective in, um, in uh, middle-aged people, you know, between 30 and 60 percent uh, generally, and that this efficacy goes to the teens, sort of 10 percent or so in the, in the elderly, more than 70. And so, um, and so this is the question. Will it be possible to have a vaccine against, uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, most likely. But how effective will this vaccine be in reducing mortality, in reducing transmission, and in doing so in particular in the elderly population? So these questions are, are open. I think we should be hopeful. Uh, I also think that we should not think as vaccine as a magic bullet. There are many other things that we should do um, besides uh, hoping a vaccine, and these things are done in particular uh, by in, in countries like, like Singapore, especially you now after you had a, a small outbreak recently, they said to test, test a lot, uh, test, uh, isolate, uh, quarantine, uh, trace contacts, uh, and as soon as we have uh, treatment, uh, treat people who are ill. And it's, uh, it's um, very good news that there was an announcement from the recovery trial very recently that actually a cheap drug, dexamethasone, is, is quite effective in, in, uh, in severe patients. Let's say there is a vaccine that gets to be developed. Are there mechanisms within the WHO to ensure that allocation is fair? For example, maybe a strategic advisory um, strategy advisory group of experts. So there has been a, um, uh, a very large international initiative, which was, uh, uh, how would they say, promoted uh, by the French president, but was organized by the president of the uh, European Commission, where she called on heads of states, heads of, uh, heads of government to come and pledge 
uh, financial resources for the Act A initiative, which means that um, at helping low and middle income countries get access to, uh, to vaccines, to drugs, to diagnostics. And also, there's also another act, uh, another uh, stream of work to try to help uh, health systems to remain uh, um, effective, resilient. So uh, through this initiative, with, where uh, more than 7 billion uh, US dollars were pledged, uh, we hope that it will be possible to purchase vaccine for those countries. But, you know, I would like, when I, when I think about uh, the past, uh, I, I can also recall that I was responsible for WHO in 2009 and 2010 uh, for an initiative which aimed at distributing H1N1 pandemic vaccines to low and middle income countries and you know, to all countries who, who, who needed it. So why was that? It was because when the pandemic started, we discovered that all the production capacity had already been pre-purchased by high income countries and was nothing to buy actually. So through negotiation with manufacturers and with uh, countries who had purchased vaccines, it was possible to obtain from the, uh, from the large companies as well as from, um, from countries a donation of 10% of their real time for manufacturers of um, a production of vaccine and from countries 10% of what they had purchased for themselves. And all these brought together uh, provided a stock of 97 million doses which were then distributed in 2010 to uh, more than uh, 80 uh, million countries, a 80 countries, sorry. So, you know, and this was for free. So I know that the, the Act A initiative is planning to buy vaccine from industry, but uh, what I would call for is that these industry who would still, you know, earn a lot of money and billions in selling vaccines to high income countries should actually donate at least 10% of their vaccine to a, um, to a, a stock body, which would be used in the, in the poorer countries. There's a question from Dr. Ko Sin Ting. Um, Dr. Kini, are you concerned that less prosperous countries will be used as test populations and then eventually when the vaccine is developed, it will be distributed to rich countries first? Uh, that's uh, that's clearly the issue, and this is what the Act A initiative is trying to uh, to to avoid. So um, certainly, you know, the, the countries who have financed uh, the vaccine research efforts, like the uh, United States, we certainly want to have vaccine to vaccine the population, absolutely. But uh, but this is why you know discussing about sharing a part, a percent. And in flu, in pandemic flu, it was 10%, which was acceptable even more because actually the disease was not that severe after all. 10% uh, was seen as something which was acceptable to countries to share 10% of what they had purchased. And this is why I'm suggesting that this might be also a mechanism. But what is also important, and this is for countries who will have access to vaccines because they purchased it, and for countries who might who will need to rely on donation to get vaccines, will be to define clearly what are the priority targets. Because it is not possible and not even wanted, I would say, that the whole world gets vaccinated at the same time with, with these vaccines. Uh, and we might all better think about which are our target population. And these targets may, be, may depend on what the vaccine do. For example, if uh, uh, I would suggest, as was for the pandemic flu, that the priority population would first be the frontline workers, health workers, but not only. But these are what? 2% of global population? That's not that much. That's really feasible in all countries very early. And that's what is the next group. Well, you would say the elderly, because clearly the risk of death is linked to age. But then the question is, are these vaccines Efficacious in elderly, we don't know. If they are, sure, the elderly should go and then in the second uh, priority. But if it's, they don't work in the elderly, so maybe then we should try to vaccinate those who are in contact with elderly, uh, rather than the elderly themselves. And, and all these questions, I think, should be prefer, prepared in advance because that they will help um, have an, uh, a modeling of how much vaccine will be needed everywhere. 
Um, Dr. Allen, sorry to take away some of your moderator prerogatives, but shall we move to the next slide? Yes, please. This was a article that you uh, tweeted uh, favorably about. Can you tell us a little bit about it? I think you've touched on it a bit, but it also uh, uh, speaks to your role uh, in, uh, in one of the organizations that you're chair of. Yes, indeed. And thanks for asking. I'm the chair of Medicines Patent Pool, which is a foundation uh, in which has been created by Unitech. Uh, uh, so the idea of the, of the patent pool was to, to, be, to, um, to negotiate from innovators uh, rights for their patents on essential medicines. And initially, it was only HIV medicines. Uh, to be able to sub-license these rights to generate manufacturers, uh, a few, quite a few of them actually, and, and then to drive the prices down um, through gen generic competition. And this was very successful because indeed uh, all the second and third line HIV uh, treatment are now available to developing country, countries in, uh, at a much lower price due to uh, generic uh, uh, competition. So uh, the model was later extended to tuberculosis, to hepatitis C, and more recently, we are trying to see what we can do in terms of medicines against non-transmissible diseases, against uh, uh, cancer, against uh, diabetes, and so on. And when the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic came, the board of the medicines patent pool allowed an expansion of the scope of the, of the organization to any product uh, active for COVID-19. So the idea would be that through uh, pooling and through uh, uh, getting, getting into MPP these patents, uh, they could be sub-licensed to generic manufacturers, which could also, could also make this cheaper drug. So why is it a win-win situation? Well, first, it's a win situation uh, for the patient because they will get access to uh, drugs more quickly and more cheaply. It's a win for the, uh, the development agency who provide money to buy these, these, these drugs. It's a win for the, uh, for the generic manufacturers because they get access to the patents more quickly. And it's a win also for the, for the innovators because you know, these markets have no value for them. They, they earn so little in low-income countries. It's not even worth it. And, and so by trusting their patents to the medicines patent pool, they make sure that the drugs are made available. They, and they don't have to invest time and energy to make sure that this happens. So, uh... Do the generic manufacturers, are there concerns because the price is such a driving issue? Is there concerns about uh, the quarter, uh, corners being cut with regard to quality? Uh, well, you know, there they have been breaks of quality, and I'm, I'm the same in developing country that manufacturers, but likewise, you know, in the IFA manufacturers, there are also stories, and, and the FDA is, is looking at it. Mm. So I think these are rumors to try to discredit uh, generic drugs uh, in, in many countries, you know, and in the U.S. in particular, drugs are, uh, generic drugs are discredited. But I think for no good reason than competition and trying to keep the business. Uh, so there are uh, excellent quality um, manufacturers uh, in uh, some generic uh, um, uh, providers. Yeah. And, and WHO, in addition, is actually doing what is called pre-qualification, which is a quality check uh, on a number of products, especially for HIV, but not only. And, and this, uh, this uh, entails inspection and, uh, and looking at the slide at the quality and uh, pre-qualified uh, drugs are usually a very high quality. So does MPP uh, license only vaccines and treatments or are there personal protective devices or diagnostics or anything else? So historically, we have only done drugs, mm. but we are we are looking at uh, doing it with, for vaccines also. So vaccines is a bit more complicated because you know it's a more how they say it's a more concentrated um, um, system in terms of production. You have less in terms of number and bigger uh, uh, multinationals. 
And also there's a lot of know-how because also most the vaccines are also biologicals. So, so they're no generic biologicals, they are biosimilar. So it's more complicated to make them, but it is definitely worth it. And we have been discussing with a few, uh, with a few companies for the timing of what I understand, no company was to give their rights. On the contrary of, uh, of drug manufacturers, for example, uh, the MPP has negotiated worldwide rights um, for generic manufacturers on uh, Abdi's Caletra, which is Lopinavir Reconavir. We still don't know whether it will work for, for COVID, but if it works, uh, MPP will be, be able to provide rights for manufacturers who are already, by the way, making this drug for, for HIV. Claire? This is a question from Sally Wee of the New York Times. Um, Dr. Kini, um, so many companies and institutes have found an issue in recruiting volunteers because the outbreak is also waning in these countries. Do you have any recommendations and comments about this situation because it might affect the vaccine development timeline? Well, uh, of course, it's very important to have volunteers. And at the beginning for the first phases, you can do this in any country because you don't need uh, to have uh, any incidence of disease. But as soon as you need to assess the efficacy, then you need to be able to recruit, uh, uh, recruit volunteers in countries where the, the, vaccine, the, the virus is circulating. So currently we see the Chinese, for example, who work a lot on the early prototypes of vaccine are uh, have difficulties with, because there's no, there's not enough uh, disease in, in China to, to volunteer to test the efficacy and they're looking at other options. For example, Sinovac is discussing with, uh, with Brazil. Uh, likewise, uh, AstraZeneca uh, at Oxford, uh, actually who, purchased, who provided the vaccine for the AstraZeneca product, has started, is just starting a clinical trial in, in Brazil also. So, but it's very important to, to, to um, to become a volunteer, and uh, and I must say, you know, I myself was a volunteer for uh, for Ebola vaccines. I, I got the vaccine twice, once in Geneva and once in, uh, in in the Guinea. And I think that if we want to accelerate the development of vaccine, it's important to have as many people accepting to volunteer uh, to uh, to uh, to serve in this clinical trial. Can I as I as I'm as I'm in Singapore? Can I uh, can I say something about Singapore? Please. What I would like to do is actually recognize the efforts of um, of uh, 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 an organization called DSAID, uh, and and DSAID is the is the non-profit company who actually collects sequences of the COVID vaccines from everywhere. So all the all the sequences that you see in all press releases, all the sequences that you get uh, from uh, uh, in the next plane application are all collected through this aid. And, uh, and this aid has a lot of support from Singapore. Uh, and I would like to recognize here my colleague Sebastian for all the work that he does to, to help the world have access to accurate, up-to-date uh, sequences from, uh, uh, from uh, COVID-19, which help enormously the development of uh, COVID vaccine, not only, but also help assess whether the mutate the virus mutates so quickly that the vaccine may need to be changed, or whether the vaccine is stable enough, for the timing it looks stable enough. So thank you very, very much to DC and to Singapore. Well, that's very kind of you, and that is an excellent segue to us uh, ending our question and answer period. We thank you, thank you very much. Um, we're running out of time, so we're going to uh, move over to uh, Dale, who's going to update us on current events. Dale? Okay, so um, a few things uh, this week. Uh, we've just heard Marie Paul talk about uh, the ACT Accelerator. So I, I, this is not a setup, I might add. Uh, this was uh, a recent presentation I, I got from, uh, from Bruce Aylward. So he was happy for me to share the slides. Um, also talk a little bit about uh, the case numbers and, and what the serology and asymptomatic and what all that's all about and a disinfection tunnel has come back. Okay, so this is called the ACT Accelerator. It's the access to, to COVID-19 tools. Now, um, well, what this means is that we, there's these three vertical pillars. 
vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And underneath all of that is health systems strengthening. Okay, so as, as we look here, what, what each of these pillars is going to be run by, by two uh, co-conveners, if you like. Now, th these organizations, so l let me just say, this is all about equitable global access for, for, for these sort of innovations. And it's, it's really this unprecedented um, level of, of, uh, uh, of partnership, of cooperation between these, these huge global organizations. SEPI, uh, as you know, is involved in particularly vaccine uh, innovation. Garvey is also vaccines. Um, FIND is, is a, uh, a laboratory group, um, uh, particularly so, so diagnostics and innovation there. Whereas um, the last one is the, what is it, the, the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and malaria. So, so all these are, are, are big players in respective areas. And this is about getting, um, getting these people to work together to, to run each of these pillars. And they're, they're fully empowered. Um, they develop and implement work plans to, to bring about uh, innovative work and then, and then the sharing of it. Um, the support mechanisms, there's some WHO envoys, but this is not primarily a W, well, it's, I guess it's WHO led, but it's, it's, it's really handed off to these other organizations to run with it. There's weekly video conferences um, uh, and things like that. So what I, I just thought there were some, some good words actually that are, are not so good if they're paraphrased. So just to read it out, the substantial gaps in immunity to COVID-19 will result in continued and substantial waves of disease. These are the, the core assumptions, at least to the end of 2021. Straining health systems and further disrupting societies and economies. There are multiple potential approaches to, to change the spread and profile, thereby restoring functional societies and economies. So, and it's about further innovation. So the assumption is that this is gonna be a problem with us until the end of 2021 and, and innovation is needed. So the assumption for vaccines, an innovative platform-based vaccine could be available by the end of 2020, but with limited supply. The quantities for, for key, key subgroups could be available in the first half of next year. Therapeutics, new molecules of biologics will be needed to achieve the significant reductions. Uh, the, it, it's unlikely that repurposing drugs is, is going to be sufficient. So these are, the assumptions that this group works on. And the diagnostics, we've got expansion of the PCR technologies, which is what is now, but innovatively, uh, we're looking at a rapid antigen diagnostic would be, would be the, the sort of favored one, particularly point of care. And, and then above the, uh, beyond, beyond this is all the local capacities uh, in each country need to be substantially strengthened to, to do this. So, so this is the whole, the sort of high level framework for how the, the ACT Accelerator works. Phase one is gonna be improving expansion of what we have now. Phase two uh, is introducing uh, new tools that can complement the, the non-pharmacologic interventions. The non-pharmacological interventions being all the, the contact tracing and the, and the uh, isolating and the, the diagnostics and uh, and uh, social distancing, all these things. And then phase three is transitioning the new tools uh, into sort of core business. And, and as well, you can see how this, through the rest of this year, we wanna get it out and equitable in, in the first half of next year, developing the tools and seeing them come online. And then the last half of the year is transitioning so that every country has got uh, equitable access to, to, to the tools. I, I like this one. This is the, the risk mitig mitigation. Um, so uh, can the virus mutate? Uh, are there going to be severe cases shifting towards younger populations? Um, and, and is the immune response going to be long lasting? Uh, then product and delivery related risks that actually these tools that we, we create uh, won't be as good as we had hoped. Um, difficulties with, with scaling up. Uh, and, and I won't read through them all, but you can see 
that there's a, a really good uh, uh, business approach to, to, to the risk and, and the mitigation. So uh, that's the ACT Accelerator. I think it's a, it's a, a good intervention and, and it's very inclusive and, and obviously got, the, uh, got, a, got a very sensible approach. So, um, so you saw this picture right at the beginning. We've got 8.3 million cases now and just under 450,000 deaths. So as I, as I, uh, as I overlie this, this is from uh, Resolve. You, you would have heard about them last week uh, and also CDC. And, and they've put together sort of the, what, what we know about what a, what a death relates to. Therefore, uh, looking here, how many infections that is. And of those, inf so that's based on serology. So then of those infections, how many are symptomatic and asymptomatic? So with all the evidence we've, we know, this is really what we've, uh, what they've come up with. So, so in, in that case, um, this would imply instead of the US having 2 million cases, looking at their number of deaths, then they would have had 14 million cases. So I think it's an, uh, you remember a few weeks ago, I spoke about this number actually becoming less and less relevant as we learned more about asymptomatic cases and, uh, and serology positive and things. So I think that might be worth bearing in mind that whenever you're looking at a country, the maths is easier if you do, if you do 1%, but uh, so if 1% if of people die, then instead of uh, 450, then that should be more like, uh, what, 45 million. So, so, so instead of 8 million, it's probably 45 million infected in the world. These are back of the envelope figures, of course, but I think they're, they're just sort of a, a little bit helpful to, 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 to apply all, all that we're learning. So that was, um, that was all I wanted to say about that graphic, which I thought was very interesting. And just the last one is on this, uh, this tunnel. Uh, just when I, when I thought I'd seen the last of disinfection tunnels, I, I, I hear on the news last night that, that uh, Mr. Putin has got one uh, at his residence and, and you can see nice businessmen have to come here and get, get squirted with, with dis environmental disinfection materials. So with that, David, uh, I'll bid you a good week. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Dale. Um, let me just summarize uh, some of the key points tonight uh, briefly. We're, we're short of time, but I feel the need to do so. Um, I, I, we heard that an under, uh, underfunded uh, WHO is not in anyone's interest. It's the glue uh, that holds uh, many of these uh, uh, individual countries and uh, efforts to provide uh, public health uh, together. Um, we learned that uh, vaccine will not be the magic bullet uh, that we hope it would be. Those who need it most are least likely to respond to a vaccine. So we, we, we need to look beyond just vaccines. Uh, and uh, we'll only survive this pandemic by working together. Uh, nationalism, uh, capitalism probably won't be the solution to this. This is going to require uh, everyone uh, volunteering uh, working toward a common cause. So that leaves me uh, to thank uh, Dr. Kenny for insightful uh, responses to our questions and taking the time from her busy day to be with us and to announce uh, next week's speaker who will be uh, Professor Heidi Larson, uh, uh, Lawson. Uh, she is a director of the Vaccine Confidence uh, uh, Project uh, and a professor of anthropology, risk and decision science at the London School of Health and Tropical Medicine, as well as associate professor at the Department of Global Health, University of Washington, and a fellow of Chatham House uh, Center on Global Health Security. Uh, her title of her talk will be The State of Vaccine Confidence in the Era of COVID-19. There's a chat box tool at the bottom of your screen. We would appreciate your feedback. Uh, that chat box will be open for another 10 minutes or so after the close of the uh, uh, episode. We do encourage your uh, comments. Until next week, stay safe and wash your hands. And finally, Harvey Danger concisely described the emotional state of most, most of us in 2020 when he sang the song, I'm not sick, but I'm not well. Good night. <laughs>